Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leanne. I'm the lecture coordinator for the Peninsula Seniors. And today, I'd like to welcome Peter Small. He's a historical impressionist, and he's appeared at several of the presidential libraries. He's been at Reagan Library, the Herbert Hoover Library, the Richard Nixon Library, and the George Bush Library. He's also appeared on the History Channel. Uh, today, you're going to meet him as George Washington, and he will separate fact from myth about the cherry tree to crossing the Delaware River. Excuse me, I've just been riding around my plantation here at Mount Vernon, and you know how cold it gets here in December. That's right. It's December 12th, 1799, and do you realize in less than three weeks it will be January 1800, a new year and a new century, and I hope... <coughs> I hope I'll be well enough to live to see that new century. After all, I've lived all of my past 67 years here in this century, the 18th century, and I hope that... <coughs> I hope I'll be well enough to live to see the new century, the 19th century. Well, I'm very delighted to have you here at my home of Mount Vernon, here on the banks of the Potomac River, here in my native state of Virginia. And I happen to have brought with me a portrait of me. And I would like your honest opinion of it. Do you like it? Yes. You do? I don't. Oh, it's terrible. The man who painted it, Gilbert Stewart, he didn't like me. I mean, look how he made me look so tight-lipped, like I was old and enfeebled. Well, I am an old man. I'm already... 67 years old, but I'm not in Fabald. You know why he painted me this way? Excuse me a mo moment, I'll show you why. He made me take up my false teeth, that's why. <laughs> now, now, I know you've heard stories that I had false teeth made out of wood. That is not true. I had several sets of false teeth. One was made out of elephant ivory, the other out of hippopotamus teeth, and they were connected to the back with a spring. And that's why I look so terrible, this painting. Uh, excuse me a moment. Oh. oh, my. That feels so much better. Oh, the stories they tell about me. Wooden teeth? Why, another story said I was so strong I could take a silver dollar and toss it across the Delaware River. Or was that the Potomac River? <laughs> oh, oh, I don't even remember. And then there's another story, and I know you've heard this one, that apparently when I was a little child, my father gave me a hatchet like this. And like any little child, I ran around our farm in Virginia chopping up little pieces of wood. And there on our farm stood a sapling, a young fruit tree. Now let's see, was that an orange tree? No, no, we don't grow oranges in Virginia. Lemons? No, no, we don't grow lemons in Virginia. No, not avocados, we don't grow those in Virginia. Um, no, it wasn't an apple tree, it wasn't a pear tree, it wasn't even a, a peach tree. Why, my memory has seemed to have failed me, perhaps you could help me. What kind of a tree was it, everyone? Ah, uh, yes, it was a cherry tree. And according to the story, I took my hatchet and I chopped down the cherry tree. Well, then I ran off and played the rest of the day. Well, you could imagine my father's reaction when he found out that someone had chopped down his poor young cherry tree. And then he called out, Who chopped down my cherry tree? Well, I was young and frightened. What should I do? Should I lie about it? No, you know what the correct answer is. Tell him the truth. I went up to my father and I said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I did it. And my father then said to me, Bless you, George. Bless you for telling the truth. And since that day, I have had a reputation for honesty. 
integrity, for never having told a lie, and always telling the truth. <laughs> but I'll tell you the truth. Never happened. <laughs> oh, oh no, I'll tell you what really happened. There is a gentleman out there by the name of Mason Locke Weems. Uh, he's a minister, he calls himself Parson Weems, and he has been writing and editing an encyclopedia. Well, you know an encyclopedia contains many articles of information. Among those were my biography. Well, apparently when he was writing my biography, he decided he would add a few extra paragraphs to it, including the story of the cherry tree. Now, why would he write a story about me that's not even true? Well, he actually has very good and honorable intentions. You must remember that in this year of 1799, we're still a very young nation. We're only well, 23 years old. Yes, it is true. We have grown from 13 to now 16 states in our union. But the problem is we don't always think of ourselves as being one people and one nation, Americans. The problem is we still think of ourselves as being South Carolinians, Rhode Islanders, New Yorkers, Virginians, Pennsylvanians, Marylanders, instead of thinking of ourselves as Americans. And Parson Weems wanted me to be the symbol, especially to the children and young people, that they would look up to me as the unifying symbol of our nation. And I have tried to be honest throughout my life, and I have tried to tell the truth, and I've also tried to be of service to my fellow man. And Parson Weems wanted me again, to be the symbol to the children and young people, that they would follow my example and be good citizens and be of service to their fellow man. Now, when I was born, which was 67 years ago in 1732, uh, I'm sure many of you know my actual birth date, which was what? February 22nd, 1732. Uh, that was according to the Gregorian calendar. Oh, oh, I should explain, when I was born, Great Britain was still using the Julian calendar, and um, my birthday was actually on February 11th, 1732. But when I reached adulthood, Great Britain had changed over to the Gregorian calendar, so my birthday was moved to February 22nd. Now, when I was born, there was no United States of America. We were colonies of Great Britain, and we regarded ourselves as well, loyal Englishmen. Why, one of the first books I read and actually copied verbatim was a book on etiquette for becoming an English gentleman because that is what I desired to be. Why, when I was even 14 years old, I wanted to enlist in the British Navy and serve in His Majesty's fleet. But my older half-brother Lawrence and my mother persuaded me not to do so. So as I grew into adolescence, I became a surveyor. I went out exploring, measuring, and mapping the new unexplored lands of Western Virginia. And when I reached adulthood, I desired to be an officer in His Majesty's Army. Well, the only way I could achieve that as a colonist was to enlist in the militia of the colony of Virginia, where I was commissioned as an officer. Now, at this time in the 1750s, there were great tensions between the two major powers of Europe, Britain and France. They were rivals for power in Europe. They were also rivals for empire here in North America. And as it happened, the French had built forts on British territory in western Pennsylvania. So the Royal Lieutenant Governor of Virginia sent me and my militiamen out into western Pennsylvania to tell the French to evacuate their forts from British territory. We confronted the French soldiers, had a shooting incident with them. And you know, I have to tell you, there was something romantic about the whistling of bullets going by me. <laughs> but that's before I found out how terrible and horrible war really is. But because of this shooting incident, a war broke out between Britain and France. In it lasted for nearly seven years. In Europe, they remembered it as the Seven Years' War. Here in America, we remember it as the French and Indian War. Well, I thought, here was my opportunity to show what kind of a brave soldier I could be for His Majesty King George of England. But I had a lot of terrible lessons to learn. 
Well, I never led men into combat before, and all I knew about fighting was what I'd read in books. Well, my inexperience was to be demonstrated. I led my soldiers, or actually my militiamen, out into western Pennsylvania, where we built a fort. We called it Fort Necessity. What happened? We were surrounded by the soldiers of the French Army, experienced, well-trained, professional, well-equipped soldiers of the French Army surrounding us ill-equipped and poorly trained militiamen. We ran out of ammunition, and what was I forced to do with my first military command? Capitulate. Surrender. Well, the French commander felt so sorry for me. Well, after all, I was nothing more than a poor, young, and inexperienced colonial militiaman. I certainly could never be as good a soldier as any Frenchman or even Englishman. So he allowed me to sign a document of surrender, which I did. Of course, the problem is I didn't understand a single word of it. Oh, it was written in French. But he allowed me and my men to retreat back to the British lines, promising never to attack the forces of His Majesty the King of France. Oh, I also took responsibility for killing his brother and starting this war. Oh, you remember the shooting incident that started the war? His brother was a French diplomat who was killed in that scuffle, and I ended up taking responsibility for the whole thing. But still, we had many lessons to learn. You see, in North America, Wars were going to be fought a little differently than they were fought in Europe. Now in Europe, when armies fought, they fought out in the open, in a field of battle, with two opposing armies facing each other literally in an open field of battle, with, with two opposing armies lining up in formation. They would approach one another, and when they came within range of each other, they'd wait for the order of the commanding officer and aim and fire at each other. That's how they fought wars in Europe. However, the Indians, who were the allies of the French, well, they don't fight like this. Out in the open, you give the advantage to your enemy. Instead, the Indians fight by hiding behind rocks and trees and ambushing and surprising their enemy. And the French would adopt those tactics against us with deadly results. As it happened, the French built a fort out in western Pennsylvania at the junction of two strategic rivers, the Monongahela and Allegheny. At that point, those two rivers form the Ohio River. The French built a fort there. They called it Fort Duquesne. However, I believe some of you may know it by a different name today. I understand it is called, um, oh yes, Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, we were determined to capture Fort Duquesne, but we were not going to be led by inexperienced colonial militiamen. No, no, no. This time we were going to be led by well-trained, professional, experienced, well-equipped soldiers of the British Army led by a brave British commander, General Braddock. He led us out towards Fort Duquesne, but the French were not waiting for us at the fort. They were waiting for us behind rocks and trees, and when we marched by, they opened and fired. General Braddock was shot and killed. I had two horses shot out from under me. Four bullets went through my coat, but a single one did not hit me. Two-thirds of our force were killed, and the remaining one-third I led in retreat back to the British lines. There we secretly buried General Braddock in a spot that the French soldiers wouldn't find him. Later on, under Colonel Forbes, we went out with a stronger force, and after heavy, fi and after heavy fighting, finally captured Fort Duquesne. And after seven years of fighting, Britain finally defeated France and now controlled all of North America. But there were to be many changes here in North America and in my own personal life. Well, first of all, my older half-brother Lawrence had died. Oh, uh, let me explain. He was my father Augustine Washington's first son from his first marriage. Uh, my father's first wife had died, and my father remarried a woman named Mary Ball, and I became their first son by my father's second marriage. Well, my father died when I was 11, and... Well, Lawrence became like a substitute or surrogate father to me. I greatly admired and respected him. And unfortunately, when he passed away, he had no male heirs. But I, so as a result, I inherited from him this estate of Mount Vernon, where we are today, here on the banks of the Potomac River. I've since enlarged this house many times, increased my land holdings, where I, I am now one of the great landowners in all of Virginia. 
Here I raise many crops and raise much livestock, but I don't do it all alone. No, I have, of course, a large staff of servants and slaves, but more importantly, I have an important life partner, my dear wife, Martha. Now, when I met her more than 40 years ago, she was a lovely young widow by the name of Martha Dandridge Custis. By the way, did you know she was also the wealthiest widow in Virginia? <laughs> well, Martha and I have been married for more than 40 years. And when I married Martha, she had two surviving children from her previous marriage, Jack and Patsy. And although Martha and I never had children of our own, I raised and loved Jack and Patsy as if they were my own natural children. Unfortunately, they are no longer with us today. Patsy died of epileptic seizures when she was about 17. Jack was an officer with me at Yorktown when we were fighting the British, and disease spread through the camp, and Jack did not survive. But he left me his two young children, Little Washington and Nellie Custis, and I have raised and loved them as if they were my own natural children. Now, I've always wondered why Martha and I never had children of our own, and I've always wondered about that, but some people believe it could have been a result of a voyage I took to Barbados in the West Indies. Uh, you see, when my brother Lawrence was dying of consumption, I believe you call it tuberculosis, we felt that the climate might restore his health. So we sailed to Barbados in the West Indies. Oh, by the way, this was the only time I ever left the continent of North America or what would become the future United States of America. Unfortunately, the climate did not restore Lawrence's health and he passed away. But while I was in Barbados, I contracted smallpox. And while I obviously recovered, many people believed it may have affected my fertility. However, during our War of Independence, and especially during those terrible winters at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania and Morristown in New Jersey, when disease spread through the camp, I was immune because I had already suffered from those diseases. I also became very involved in the affairs of the colony of Virginia. I was elected to its constituent assembly, the Virginia House of Burgesses, where we helped govern the colony of Virginia. However, as a result of its victory in the French and Indian War, Britain needed to station more soldiers here in North America and needed someone to pay their war debt. And whom do you think they expected to pay for it? Yes, us, the colonists. How by taxes? And who imposed these taxes? A parliament that sat thousands of miles away in London, England. A parliament which claimed to represent all Englishmen. Well, weren't we Englishmen here in America? Did we not have the rights of Englishmen? Where was our voice in that parliament? Where was our elected representatives? There was no one there whom we elected or who spoke for us. So we protested these unfair laws controlling our trade and commerce and these unfair taxes levied against us. The cry went out from the colonies, no taxation without representation. We petitioned the British King and Parliament. We protested to the King and Parliament, but our petitions and protests were ignored or rejected by both King and Parliament. And when the good people of Massachusetts stood up to protest in April of 1775. King George and the British Parliament responded by force of arms against the good people of Massachusetts. We of the 13 American colonies decided to take action. We met as a Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that spring of 1775. I was elected one of several delegates from the colony of Virginia. It was there we voted to raise a continental army to resist British aggression. We also needed a commander-in-chief to lead this new army. Now, since the war began in the north, in Massachusetts, it was felt that we needed a commander-in-chief from the south who had military experience. See, military experience from the south. Hmm. Virginia is a southern colony. I have military experience. Now. I didn't say anything, 
But while they were discussing who the Southerner with military experience should be, I happened to be wearing my Colonel's militia uniform. <laughs> so when they were looking for that Southerner with military experience, why, whom do you think they chose? Yes, they chose me, George Washington, to be Commander-in-Chief of the New Continental Army. And when they asked me, Mr. Washington, oh, pardon us, General Washington, how much shall we pay you? How much of a salary do you desire? Do you know how much I asked for? Nothing, yes, nothing. I wanted no salary, for I was doing this in the service of a cause I believe in. All I asked was that the Congress pay for my expenses. Well, I took command of our army in outside of Boston, Massachusetts in the late spring of 1775. The British army had occupied the city of Boston. The British Navy had blockaded and closed Boston Harbor. We were facing the greatest military empire in the world. We had no navy and not much of an army. How could we resist against such a mighty power? Well, that winter in northern New York, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys had captured Fort Ticonderoga, the strongest fort in all of North America. So what did we do? We took the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga, brought them over the Berkshire Mountains, across Massachusetts, to our positions outside of Boston. There, we set up the cannons where the British Army and Navy could clearly see them. And when they saw those heavy artillery pieces, the British got up and evac soldiers got up and evacuated the city of Boston, boarded the ships, and the ships withdrew from Boston Harbor. Our army entered and liberated the city of Boston without firing a single shot. We had won a great victory, but we had not yet won the war. The following year, on July 4th, 1776, we declared ourselves to be the free and independent United States of America. But the year we declared our independence, we nearly lost it. The British Army and Navy sailed into New York Harbor, where I had taken command of our army in New York City. They attacked us at Brooklyn and defeated us at the Battle of Long Island. We retreated across the East River to Manhattan Island. The British attacked us at Kipps Bay and Harlem Heights, and we retreated north of the city to White Plains. We were defeated at the Battle of White Plains, and we retreated across the Hudson River into New Jersey. We were forced to evacuate Fort Lee, and we retreated across New Jersey, across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. And by now, it was late December of 1776. Every battle we had fought that year, we had lost. Six months earlier, I had 20,000 men under my command. And now my army had dwindled to only 2,000 and their enlistments would end in a week's time on January 1st, 1777. I even wrote to my surviving brother, I felt as if the game was over. And here it is. It's already December 25th. You know what that means, don't you? Christmas. We certainly did not have much to celebrate that Christmas. But 10 miles down the river, across the river in Trenton, New Jersey, were the Hessians, the mercenaries, the paid German soldiers of the British Army. They would have much to celebrate, and why not? They had defeated us in every battle that year, and I can imagine what their Christmas would be like. They would be eating, drinking, celebrating, making merry. At Wait, they'd be eating, drinking, and celebrating. Would they be ready to fight? No unless I could get my army across the Delaware River. It won't be easy, for there are no bridges across the Delaware. The river's flowing very high and swiftly, and if any of us were to fall in, we would all freeze to death. But if I can get the remnants of my army across the Delaware River, march on Trenton, surprise the Hessians and attack them in the morning, we might be able to turn the tide of war. But before we embarked that night, I read some inspiring words to my soldiers. They were written by a great pamphleteer and propagandist by the name of Thomas Paine. 
You know, earlier that year, he had printed a pamphlet called Common Sense, where he made the argument for American independence from Britain. He had fled New York with us and now had written and printed a new pamphlet called The American Crisis. And I read its inspiring words to my men before we embarked that night. I'd like to share some of those words with you. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this glorious triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery then there is not such a thing as slavery upon earth. Even the expression is impious, for so unlimited a power can belong only to God. I call not upon a few, but upon all, not on this state or that state, but on every state. Up and help us. Lay your shoulders to the wheel. Better have too much force than too little, when so great an object is at stake. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and to repulse it. Say not that thousands are gone. Turn out your tens of thousands. Throw not the burden of the day upon providence, but show your faith by your works, that God may bless you. This is our situation, and who will may know it? By perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious issue by cowardice and submission. The sad choice of a variety of evils, a ravaged country, a depopulated city, habitations without safety, and slavery without hope, our homes turned into barracks and bawdy houses for Hessians, and a future race to provide for, whose fathers we shall doubt of. Look on this picture and weep over it. And if yet remains one thoughtless wrench who believes it not, let him suffer it unlamented. With those inspiring words, I met, led my men across the Delaware River. We marched 10 miles through a storm before we arrived in Trenton that morning. And just as I had suspected, the Hessians were sleeping off from their Christmas celebration. We surprised and attacked them at Trenton defeating them without losing a single one of our soldiers. A week later, we again defeated the British at Princeton, and we kept the cause of independence alive throughout 1777. But in late 70, 1777, at Germantown and Brandywine in Pennsylvania, the British Army again defeated us, and again we were forced to retreat into Pennsylvania to a place called Valley Forge. There would be no counterattack as last winter, for the British were on the same bank of the Delaware River as we were, well housed, well supplied, well fed, while my soldiers and I were freezing in the fields and forests of Valley Forge. We were forced to chop down trees to build log cabins. My soldiers were ragged, our supplies were low, disease spread through the camp, and Morale dropped, and there were times I felt I had to call upon divine guidance to give us the faith and the strength to make it through that terrible winter. And we had the faith and the strength to make it through that winter. From Europe, two new officers came to join me. One was a young French nobleman. His name was Lafayette. He became one of my trusted generals. The other was a nobleman from the German state of Prussia. Or oh, he claimed to be a nobleman. He called himself Baron von Steuben. Well, he had been an officer in the Prussian army. And you know the Prussians are very good at military efficiency and military training. And if our army was to survive, we would have to train and drill all winter. And that's exactly what now Colonel von Steuben did. He trained and drilled my army throughout the winter and spring. 
so we were ready to fight by the time summer came. In late June of 1778, at Monmouth in New Jersey, we defeated the British Army, forcing them to retreat back to New York City. In the meantime, France wanted revenge against Britain for its earlier loss in the French and Indian War. So we signed a treaty of alliance with France. They declared war on Britain, and with the support of the French Army and Navy, we surrounded the British at Yorktown in Virginia in October of 1781. It was there that the British were forced to surrender to me. Two years later, we signed a peace treaty with Great Britain, recognizing our independence. But still we had challenges ahead. While I was serving without pay, my officers were not. And they, and they had not yet been paid by the Continental Congress. And they were demanding that the Congress pay them what was owed to them. They even wanted me to lead them on the Congress and seize the Congress if necessary to demand their back pay. I thought we had already fought against the tyranny of one king. I did not want to replace it with another. And when, we were, when I was headquartered in Newburgh, New York in the winter of 1782 and 83, my officers stormed into my headquarters demanding that I lead them upon the Continental Congress. And I said to them, gentlemen, gentlemen, I have heard your complaints and I am taking action. I have written a letter to the Continental Congress that I would like to read to you. But before I do, you will have to excuse me. While I have gone gray in the service of my nation, and then I put on my spectacles and I said, I am afraid that I am going blind. I began to read the letter, but I could see by the time I had finished reading the letter, there was not a dry eye among my officers, and they agreed not to march upon the Congress and eventually the Congress agreed to pay them their back salaries. I like to think that I saved the future of the American Republic that night. In November of 1783, I went before the Continental Congress, which was headquartered in Annapolis, Maryland at that time, and I offered my resignation as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. The following month, at Fonce's Tavern in New York, I bade an emotional farewell to my officers, thanking them for their support and their loyalty in helping us win independence and liberty. And by that Christmas day, I had returned to Mount Vernon. Did you know that when King George of England found out that I had resigned as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, had given up all that power to become a civilian again and not install myself as emperor or king, he said that I would now go down in history as the greatest man. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Now, many of you probably think I'm a good general, don't you? Well, do you? You do? Do you know I lost more battles than I won? Yes, that's true. That's not a very good record if one, was to be, if one is to be considered a good general. Why was I considered a good general? I knew how to keep the Continental Army intact. As long as I kept the Continental Army together, I kept the cause of independence alive. Even if we were defeated in battle, as long as we made an orderly retreat and I kept that army together, we would be ready to fight the next battle, the important one, that would give us victory. Now we are an independent nation, the 13 United States of America. The problem was, well, we were not very united. Yes, we did have a new government under the Articles of Confederation, but it wasn't a strong government. We didn't want a strong government. We had suffered under a strong king in Parliament, and we did not want to repeat that again here in the United States. So we set up a new government under the Articles of Confederation where the power was not with the new National Congress, but with the states. I mean, the Congress was not very effective. First of all, you needed nine out of the 13 states just to agree on anything and to pass legislation. And you know how difficult it is just to get nine men to agree on anything, let alone nine states. The Congress didn't have power to enforce its laws or its taxation. 
and the states were printing their own currency, which fluctuated from state to state. And if you bought an item in one state and you transported it to another, you would have to pay a duty on it as if you had imported it from overseas. We were not acting like one independent nation, but like 13 separate independent nations. And then when Shays' Rebellion broke out in Massachusetts in 1786, many of us realized we did not have a strong central authority to maintain law and order. Why, what if we were attacked by a foreign enemy? How could we unite in face of such a danger? Many of us realized if we continued this way, we would lose the very independence and liberties that we had fought for. We realized we needed to come up with a new plan of government or a new constitution. In the spring of 1787, we met at the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe some of you know that building by a different name. I understand some of you call it um, Independence Hall, the same building where we had declared independence 11 years earlier. We had now met to write a new plan of government or new constitution. I was elected the chairman of this conference or convention. My job was to keep order. I did not participate in the debates or discussions. That was not my role. My role was to keep the delegates on task to write a new plan of government. We also kept the meetings private and secret, not to trick or deceive the public by keeping it private, we could speak more freely with each other about the type of government we wanted. Now, we certainly didn't want to give all power to a national government. We knew that was dangerous. We couldn't give it all to the states. That had not been successful. We realized powers had to be shared between the states and the national government. And we did not want to put all power into the hands of one person or one body of government because we knew that was very dangerous we realized eventually power had to be shared among three branches of government. But still, during those four months, I sometimes wondered if we would ever succeed in establishing a new government, a new constitution. And then I recall one day at the convention, one of the delegates got up to speak. He was the oldest delegate to that convention, and he was also its wisest for he was also the most respected American in the world. He was a printer, publisher, author, philosopher, scientist, inventor, statesman, and patriot. I'm sure you'll all know whom I'm talking about. Yes, Dr. Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he noticed carved in the back of my chair was this half sun. Looking at it, he could not tell if that half sun was a setting sun or a rising sun, but he hoped for our new nation that it would be a rising sun. And finally, after four months of debating, arguing, negotiating, and compromising, we finally came up with this four-page document, a federal constitution for the United States of America. When somebody asked Ben Franklin, what do you have for us? Dr. Franklin said, a republic, if you can keep it. This was a new planning of government and a new experiment in government. A republic based upon three equal branches of government, each with powers to check and balance the other. The Congress to make laws, the president to execute the laws, and the Supreme Court to interpret those laws. Now, under this new federal constitution, a president was to be chosen. How? The states were to choose electors, according to their congressional representation, who would then choose the president. Well, when all the electors met, whom do you think they all chose? Yes, it was me, and it was a unanimous vote. Well, I was very honored to be elected our first president under our new federal constitution, but I had a great challenge before me. Yes, the Constitution defines the power of the president, but it does not define the character of the office. I mean, we had never had a president before. I had no example to follow. 
and I realized whatever I did as president would set an example or precedent for future presidents. Why, people didn't even know how I should be addressed as president. Your Excellency, Your Highness, Your Majesty. Well, that's either too formal or too royal, like a king. I'm certainly not a king, and we don't want a king here in America. And yet, we should show respect for the office, and yet show that the president is a citizen like you or me. After all, it is a republic where we elect our fellow citizens to represent us. So when people asked how I should be addressed as president, I said, well, um, how about Mr. President? I also offered to serve as president without pay, just as I had done as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during our War of Independence. But the Congress remembered my expense account. <laughs> and they said, no, Mr. President, we're putting you on a budget and a salary. <laughs> now, the Constitution says I'm to have advisors. Does that mean a First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, a Chancellor of the Exchequer, ministers? No, that's what a king has. I'm not a king. But I do need someone to head our new federal departments. So I decided I would appoint secretaries. Let's see, to handle foreign relations. I know a secretary of state. I know an excellent candidate. The man who wrote our Declaration of Independence and who was our minister to France, Thomas Jefferson. And let's see, to handle financial affairs, we need a Secretary of the Treasury. And I know another excellent candidate. He was my aide-de-camp during the war, and he has excellent ideas about finance, commerce, and industry, Alexander Hamilton. To handle the military, a Secretary of War. Why not my artillery commander during that war, Henry Knox. And finally, to handle legal affairs, an Attorney General, Edmund Randolph of Virginia. They became my first cabinet. However, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Jefferson both had very headstrong ideas about government. Mr. Jefferson believed in states' rights. Mr. Hamilton believed in a strong federal government, a federalist conception of a strong federal government centered in our cities in commerce and trade and industry, whereas Mr. Jefferson felt our interests lie with the farmers. But as president, I saw my interests as lying not with either Mr. Hamilton or Mr. Jefferson or the interests that they represented, but as representing the nation as a whole, re looking out for the interests of the entire nation, regardless of faction or region. Personally, I think this idea of political parties is very dangerous, and I don't believe it is good for the future of our republic. However, in 1792, my term was about to end as president, and the electors were to meet again, and I was happy to retire and return to Mount Vernon. But people were begging me throughout the country, no, Mr. President, no, Mr. Washington, you must stay as president. Only you can hold our fragile new republic together. And even Jefferson and Hamilton, who never seemed to agree on anything, both urged me to stand for re-election as president. So very reluctantly, I agreed to stand for re-election, the electors met again, and again, unanimously re-elected me President of the United States. And then in March of 1793, I was sworn in for a second term as President of the United States. However, later that year, we had a crisis in Europe. Britain and France were again at war, and again, my cabinet was divided. Mr. Hamilton felt we should support Britain because we trade and do business with Britain. Mr. Jefferson felt we should support France. We had a treaty of alliance with France. They had supported us in our cause of independence, and now they were experiencing their own revolution, inspired by our revolution. But I realized if we became involved in a land war in Europe, between the two major powers of Europe, we could lose the very liberties and independence that we fought for. So I issued a proclamation of neutrality and said that we would remain neutral in world affairs. And I only hope that my successors will follow that policy. <laughs> After all, as I wrote in my farewell address, we should not be involved with entangling alliances. Now 1796 was approaching and the electors were to meet again. And do you know what people were begging me to do for a third time? Yes. 
serve another term as president. Do you realize at the beginning of a third term in March of 1797, I would be 65 years old? I'm an old man already. I've been president for eight years. I was commander in chief of the Continental Army for more than eight years. I don't want to be president for life. I don't want to be a king. I want to spend my final days like you, a private citizen with my family and friends at Mount Vernon. So I said, no third term for me. So I retired at the end of my second term in March of 1797. John Adams, who was our vice president, was elected our second president, and so I returned to Mount Vernon. Now, when I was sworn in as president for the first time in April of 1789, I was sworn in in New York City, which at that time was our temporary capital of the United States. The following year in 1790, we moved our capital to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which as of this state, 1799, is still our temporary capital of the United States. But we are now building a new permanent federal capital for our nation, and we're locating it about 10 miles north of my home on the banks of the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia, and we're going to call it the District of Columbia. As president in 1793, I laid the cornerstone for the building that will become the capital of the United States where the Supreme Court and Congress will meet and work. I also laid another cornerstone for the President's House or the Executive Mansion, this big white house we're building for the President. Now, I will never live there as President because I've already been President and believe me, I do not wish to be President again. But I understand that this new city will be completed by next year, 1800, and I've heard they're going to name it in my honor, Washington, D.C. But, oh, excuse me, I'm not feeling very well. I'm afraid I'm going to have to get into the house and... I'm going to have to get into bed, and Martha is going to have to take care of me. But I want to thank you all very much for coming to Mount Vernon, and I hope you enjoy the new year and the new century. <laughs> thank you all very much. If you have any questions for me, George Washington, about my life or my times or my presidency, I will do my best to answer them. Yes, sir. It is, is it true I could crack walnuts with my hands? Well, before I lost my teeth, I was able to crack them with my teeth. <laughs> and I'll let you in on a secret. I only have one natural tooth remaining. <laughs> How did I hold those troops together during that terrible winter of 1776? It was not easy. They were committed until the end of the year. And it was only after our victory in Trenton that gave them the reason to re-enlist and to fight for liberty and independence. Of all those great men we worked with, such as Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams, did any of them stand out? Well, you have to remember, in 1776, when we declared independence, the most prominent, most respected American in the world was not me. It was Benjamin Franklin. That's why he went to France to negotiate with the French government for a treaty of alliance, for he had, his reputation preceded him. I understand when he arrived in France, there were crowds greeting him as Le American, that he was greeted with open arms and with great enthusiasm throughout France. Was there any suggestion that Ms. Dr. Franklin become president? Perhaps if he was younger in 1788, I am sure that he and not I would have been elected the first president. Did I have any influence in selecting John Adams as vice president? Uh, let me explain. When we when the Constitution created the Electoral College, the idea was the electors would vote for two men. The one with the most votes would be president. The one with the second highest number of votes would become vice president. Well, of course, in 1780, 1788, I was the obvious choice for president. And Mr. Adams had the honor of coming in second. And as a result, he was elected vice president. And he was a very loyal vice president. And 
he voted to break tie votes in favor of my administration. How did I spend those last years? Well, I have so many responsibilities here to care for our farm and plantation. As a matter of fact, I was just riding around the plantation today inspecting uh, the different um, works we have going on. After all, we raise crops and raise livestock. I also have a grist mill, which has become quite successful in making whiskey and rum. Where that the Hessians were paid for by a large pearl necklace. I knew they were paid for. And the only reason they were fighting here in America was that they it was a job for them. It was a paid job. That's the only reason they were here. We had fought them and we had captured many of them. They decided to remain here and they made their lives here and became citizens of our nation. It's okay if I just step out of character? Yes. All right. How did I get into doing this? Uh, over about 25 years ago, in the late 80s, I decided to go into education. I was studying for a, a teacher certification at the University of Maryland, and when I was doing things such as teacher observation, student teaching, and even teaching religious school part-time, I developed this idea of dressing up as different historical figures to make the lesson interesting. That's how I got into this. And then, um, for 10 years, I did... Um, educational programs at Knott's Berry Farm, including the, I was most of the time the presenter at the Edison Workshop, but that gave me a flexible schedule that allowed me over the last 20 years to go out to groups, organizations, clubs, schools, retirement homes, libraries, um, uh, any, you know, senior centers, uh, wherever, to perform my uh, different costume presentations. What other historical characters do I portray? Besides Washington, I'm developing John Adams. I do Thomas Jefferson. Uh, some of, I think some of the ones I will mention, I think some of you have seen or have been videotaped by this program. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Edison, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Golda Meir, and Moses. <laughs> do I have a favorite character to portray? I like... Uh, over the years, I've learned to like all of my characters. Uh, there are some that I personally like just because of who they are. Um, and it depends on the age group I'm performing for. For example, for children, I enjoy doing Washington and Edison because the children's version I do is much more interactive than what you just saw. I have children come up with me as Washington and we pretend to cross the Delaware River or freeze at Valley Forge. Uh, with Edison, I'm doing basically sci uh, homemade science experiments with the children. Um, for adults, my two favorites that I enjoy doing, and I enjoy doing all of them for adults, is actually Harry Truman, is someone I've always admired, and Golda Meir. Were there ever any annoying questions that were thrown at me? Actually, one question I get regularly from children is, why am I dressed this way or why am I wearing a wig? <laughs> and when I, I, and I, I've had that question so many times, I'm, or I have a prepared answer for it. So I say to the children, why? Of course, when I'm in character, I'll be saying, why? Doesn't your father wear a wig when he goes to church on Sunday? And they'll say, no. And then there'll be some smart aleck in the audience saying, take it off. Or they'll even say, why don't you take off your wig? I say, well, you take off your wig. I will take off mine. Every time I've done that with a school audience, all the children will spontaneously pull their hair. <laughs> oh. Yeah, the challenge is, is, you know, staying in character and staying in that time period. Um, that, that's what I find the biggest challenge. But yes, uh, another one is with younger children, they'll ask me if I know Lincoln, and I will say in character is Washington, yes, I know Lincoln, Benjamin Lincoln. He was one of my officers. He was the, Benjamin Lincoln happened to be the commander of the Massachusetts militia. So, of course, the children go, no, 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 Abraham, Abraham. I go, oh, is that his son or his grandson? Question was, uh, were Franklin and Washington close? Obviously, they were contemporaries. They worked very well with one another. Um, whether they were close friends, I, I don't know. But they obviously got along with each other. And, of course, you have to realize, in the case of Franklin, he was, he was, he was about 26 years older than, Fra than Washington. <laughs> I mean, even Washington would admit that there were people probably a lot smarter, a lot more creative, a lot more talented than he. But Washington had that one great talent was that when he walked into a room, you know, I was asked about his, his height before, you know, a man was six feet two inches, weighed 220 pounds, which was considered a giant at that time. He walked into a room, he dominated that room. 
I mean, he was not the kind of person to glad hand, not the kind of person you'd want to slap on the back and say, hi, George, how's it going? No, people approached him with respect. And, th and he was able to use that as far as getting his point across. The other thing, too, is he was also, like any good leader and any good manager is going to do, you bring in good people and you make them work to their strengths. When he found, when, with the first cabinet, um, you know, he picked some people like Jefferson and uh, Hamilton, who politically were totally the opposite. But he felt these were the best men for the country. He felt this is good for the country. Look out for what's the best interests of the country, not what was necessary for the best interests of George Washington. And Washington was a man who had a great confidence in himself. You have to realize, uh, when he was growing up, he was you know, very ambitious. He wanted to become part of Virginia colonial society. And he was very anxious to have property. Now, the problem was, he was not the oldest son. He wasn't going to inherit his father's estate. That was going to be his brother, or his half-brother, Lawrence. Well, Lawrence died when George was you know, a young man. Um, he, George also wanted to be a, a war hero. Well, he did that in the French and Indian War. And so by the time he was 30, he had inherited his brother's estate, was a hero in the French and Indian War, was a man of military rank, and he married the wealthiest widow in Virginia. By the time he was 30, he had all that he wanted, and he was quite comfortable with who he was. I mean, the one thing that comes out about Washington is his strength of character. I mean, for example, I mentioned to you that, um, you know, he lost more battles than he won. I mean, do you want to know who was the best American battlefield general in that war? Benedict Arnold. We all saw, but that traitor, yes. That was the terrible thing about Arnold. Arnold was an outstanding commander. Uh, he almost single-handedly captured Quebec. If it hadn't been for bad weather in December of 1775, he would have captured Quebec and Canada would have been part of the United States. It was Arnold at the Battle of Saratoga who single-handedly rallied the soldiers, losing part of his leg to defeat the British. And this was a significant battle because it convinced the French to support the American cause. So the question is, yes, Arnold was a better military leader, but who had better character? The answer is obvious. It was George Washington. And the, what was important about Washington is, why was he elected president? It wasn't just because he was this great military hero. He could be entrusted with power. Thank you all very much for having me here today. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.